Hey, everybody, we're back. Yeah, we survived our first episode of the Beards and Dunn on the Run, and uh, we thought we'd try it again and see if anybody would want to watch one more time. Hey, Beards, good to see you, bud. Hey, good to see you too, Dunn. And, hey. uh, yeah, we're, Wait, we're back been, at it for episode been up to? number two. Yeah, what have you been doing since the last episode? Well, I just, honest to goodness, about an hour ago, I just pulled back into Bemidji where I live. I was out in Chamberlain, South Dakota, doing some walleye guiding out on Lake Francis Case, the Missouri River System, nice. and just got home. Uh, we're doing this. Then I got to wash clothes. Jill, my wife Jill's already down in Oklahoma City. Uh, she left this morning on an airplane, and I'm leaving tomorrow morning, and I'm speaking at the Oklahoma City Memorial Marathon this weekend, and guess guess who's going to be there? And we're going to have him on our podcast Who? down the road. Who's going to be there? Bill Rogers and Joni, Joni Benoit Samuelson. Wow. And you know these two. You've known Joan and Bill. I call them by first name, even though I've met them once in my life. But Over they're friends of yours. Years. Yeah, yeah. And so you're friends. And there's you think there's an opportunity they might come on our podcast? Oh, I know they will. I, I'll, I'll talk to Bill and, and, and Joni when I see them this weekend. And I... I I can't say 100%, but I'm almost certain they'll be more than yeah. happy to. Now, this may be surprising to you, but I think I will be tongue-tied to have Bill Rogers or Joan Benoit on our program because they are, like, they're, they're heroes of mine. And, and Mike, or excuse me, Dunn. <laughs> <laughs> um, but Dunn, we should, in case people don't know who these folks are, you know, if there might oh. not be runners that are listening. So, folks, Bill Rogers was... they. Back in the mid seventies into the early eighties, they, they called him the King of the Roads. He he won Boston for the first time in nineteen seventy five and he went on to win three more. So he won four Boston marathons. He won four New York. Yeah. New York City marathons in a row and he was going for a fifth and that'll be another story we'll talk about down the road. Yeah, somebody tripped him if I remember right. Somebody didn't they? tripped him. Oh um, my god, I wish I knew who that right was, now. man. And then done. And then Joni Benoit Samuelson, Joni uh, won the uh, Boston Marathon, I think the year you ran in 1983. Yeah, you know, we might have a photo of somebody running right next to Joni during the Boston Marathon yeah. when she set the world record. In fact, I think that individual was critical of her setting, you know, was crucial to helping her set oh, the record that day. she was pacing off of that guy. I think he was. She was drafting him like she was sucked to him like glue. And that's a story for another day. And But what Joni is most famous for, she was a tenacious runner back in her day. And at, she's 65, 66 now, and she still competes at that senior level. But uh, in 1984, so next year it'll be 40 years, she was the very first gold medalist in the first Olympic women's marathon that was held in Los Angeles. And I remember when she broke away about three miles. Yeah. Greta Weitz was in the race, who was one of the favorites. Oh. And... They, nobody went with her, and she she came into that stadium with 100,000 people cheering. It gives me shivers thinking about oh, it. I remember, and I think some of the, the broadcasters were like, oh, my God, what is she doing? You know, like, that's way too early to, to, to leave the, the, what, the right. security of the group, you know, to lay your cards on the table that early in a marathon. You know, a lot, a lot of times people are going to hold back that first half, you know, to see how they're feeling. Obviously, she knew how she was feeling that day. Yeah, and but done. When we, I'm getting we goosebumps. Get, oh, my gosh. I know. I we will get so Joni exciting. on, and I can't wait for her to talk about that. All right. Well, let's kind of get back. You know, we left off. We were talking about high school, and, and those, were, those are some interesting days. And, and I'm still kind of amazed to think that, you know, Dick, you've had such an outstanding running career. But at the end of your high school senior year, your running career, as far as you knew, was over. There was really no coaches knocking down your door trying to sign you to a, a, a full ride scholarship. Uh, you had, you know, no aspirations that, oh well, yeah, I think I could do this for for you know a living, a career. You decided what when you graduated high school. Yeah, so so done. When I, I got done with school, and I was. You know, I've been a fishing guide since I was 12, but my dad really kind of discouraged me. You can't make a living as a fishing guide. Well, I, I, I proved him wrong, but, but so I, uh, I wanted to go to uh, some kind of an agricultural college. And I, basically, I was going to come back, have a dairy farm, and, and do some guiding also. And so, you know, I wasn't the greatest student. I got C's, some D's, and you know, I just... So I probably couldn't have got accepted in a lot of spots, to be honest with you. But there was the University of Minnesota slash Wasika, 
which was about 80 miles south of the Twin Cities, and it was right in the heart of southern Minnesota farm country. So I went down there to take a look. And uh, so they were giving me a tour. And um, on my when I told them I was coming down, you kind of had to fill out a little application. And they said, did you ever do any sports in high school? And I happened to put on there, I ran cross country and I ran track my senior year. So I get down there and I get introduced to the uh, a college chemistry professor, Dr. John Fulcrod. Well, he just happened to be the cross country and track coach. I didn't know they had a program down there. And so he met with me and he really encouraged me to come on out. And, and uh, that's what I did. And it's, uh, it was, and he was a wonderful coach. I'm still close to him. He was, he did so much for me. And I, you know, he, he turned gray in his hair way before his time because of me. <laughs> because of me. <laughs> I, I'm sure I can't wait till we get some of your other coaches like Scott Underwood. And I think Scott had a full head of hair before and you were only there one semester and he lost half of his hair. <laughs> I know it. All right. Now, you know, before we go into, I, I'm, I'm really intrigued how, you know, your first season at Wasika went, how you prepared for that. But I heard a common theme for you and I, and I, you said you, your kind of your goal is maybe to go into dairy farming and it's no big, I grew up on a dairy farm and, you know, my brothers and I, we look back now and I, I know you always look back with what you call rose colored glasses. And sometimes, you know, when you're stressed at work and you're, you know, it just seems like the phone's always ringing and people need you here, need you there. You know, farm life was pretty, pretty non-complicated. It was a lot of hard work, but it was fairly routine. And maybe that's why we became distance runners because we fell into, you fall into a routine. And as long as you're following your routine, things get done. You know, and you, you get, yeah, and you meet. And, and you're willing, you know, you're willing to do that that hard work. So yeah. I went on to Wasika and uh, I got there in the fall of 1975 and uh, went out for the cross country team. And there was a, a kid on our team. His name was Keith Hausman. And he was from Litchfield, Minnesota. Unfortunately, a few years ago, he passed away and he got in a, a construction accident, mm. I think, but he was the stud on the team. He was really, really good. And, but I was pretty much our second man. And uh, we had, you know, we probably had 10 guys out for the team and we qualified for the National Junior College Cross Country Championships my first year. So here I am. I, I'd i never won in a state meet in Minnesota in cross country or track. Now all of a sudden I'm running in the National <laughs> Championship for Junior College and it was held in Rochester, Minnesota. So it was, you know, quite close by and done. I remember I, I had never been so nervous, so uptight before a race, and I, I ran terribly. I was just so uptight, and I remember I got done with that race. I mean, I gave it my best shot. I got done with that race, and I remember thinking, I have never let myself get that, uh, what's the word psyched I'm looking out? for? Yeah, <laughs> psyched out about, uh, about an event. So I didn't run very well, but... You know, I'd fallen in love with the sport of running, and then we, we had track, you know, the following spring. And our, our track, our college, did not have its own track. They uh, had a community track in the small town of Wasika, and it was a cinder track. So we never ran on, you know, rubberized track or anything like that. And But it was a – the the school really supported cross-country and especially our track program. A lot of the teachers, professors came out and helped and – we get a lot of the community would come and watch our meets. And, and a lot of that is because of coach Folkrod and his wife, Linda, you know, they really uh, kind of talked about it in the papers, a lot about our meets and everything. And it was, you know, if I would have gone on to like the university of Minnesota at, at you know, the Minneapolis St. Paul campus, I wouldn't have been invited on the team as a walk on even. And so if I would have gone there, I would have never had that opportunity to continue. They just happen to have this program. And I happened to, you know, meet the coach the very first day I went to visit. And he, you know, he, he was a wonderful coach and uh, just made it fun. And he really knew his stuff. And, you know, he was, he had no problem getting me to run enough miles. Like we were talking earlier, Mike, uh, this morning on the phone, you know, we needed somebody to kind of put the reins on us so we wouldn't yeah, run exactly. too much. So, you know, between your senior year and that first cross country season, then you were running through the summer. You didn't take this, you know, you didn't take the summer off. You knew you were going to no. be racing and competing. So once I, once I got out of, 
uh, high school, you know, I graduated, I went and, and my, my folks wanted me to go into college. I really didn't want to, but they wanted me to. So I went and looked at the Wasika right away. Well, then when he told me that they had this cross country team and stuff, so I pretty much continued to run through the summer. I wish I could remember how many miles. I was probably running 40, 50 miles a week or something like okay. that. And, and came in there and, uh, and, and and ran for the we were the fighting rams <laughs> i never you, okay very good yeah the fight the fighting rams and uh <clears throat> back then there were there was probably eight or ten community colleges throughout minnesota mm -hmm. and north dakota that we were in the same conference with each other and and at the time the or, uh, golden valley what was the name of that golden valley lutheran college yeah. they were a power were they in the twin cities they were, yeah, that's what I thought, yep, right? in, in the city of Golden Valley, right on the outskirts of Minneapolis. So they were a powerhouse. So we, we'd run against them, and they were a private college. So they, the coach there recruited, gave scholarships, stuff like that. All of us other community colleges, we didn't you know, have <laughs> anything like that. So they would just stomp on us, I mean, big time. So you finished that first cross-country season, and you know, winter comes, you're doing, going to school, running, but you're kind of thinking in the back of your head, okay, track season will be coming when the weather breaks in the spring. I don't know if they had an indoor uh, season back in those days for you guys. Well, um, what we did, so is for us distance guys, we would go, we'd go out and run outside, even in the middle of the winter, but we didn't have any indoor <laughs> facility at Wasika. But you know what? We, because it was an agricultural college and one of the programs there was equine. So they had this big indoor horse arena, you know, with dirt and mm -hmm. stuff like that. So on a really bad day, we'd go out there and we'd run inside <laughs> the stable and stuff. And, and then the, uh, coach Chuck Peterson, he coached, he was the head cross country and track coach at Mankato state university, mm -hmm. a big, you know, big university about 35 miles away. And so him and coach Fulcrod were good friends. So, in the wintertime, we would go over there probably three times a week to practice on this beautiful indoor I, facility. I ran on that track. Yeah. Yeah. But but we had to do it after they were done with their practices, yeah, sure. you know. But that was a big deal to go and run on an indoor surface like that. And then we did have some meets over there. And uh, and I did – one year I, I qualified for the National Junior College uh, 5K Indoor Championships. And that was held over in Detroit, Michigan. And that was my second year when I was there, I qualified. But so my running, Mike, done, mm -hmm. continued to get a little bit better when I got into college because now, you know, two miles was as far as I could run in high school track and three miles for cross country. But now all of a sudden I could run 10,000 meters in track. And it seemed like the further I ran, the, the better I just kind of seemed to do. So I was very fortunate and it just continued to progress. Now, I know I read, you know, We'll get into, you have a world record for progressive personal bests in the marathon. That's a Guinness yeah. Book of World Records. Like you haven't done enough in running already. But your very first, I know your very first marathon was the Pavo Nermi, which I think is just, a, what a great name for a marathon because he was such a fantastic, famous Finnish runner back in the 30s yes. or whatever it was, 20s and 30s. And I don't know that much about the race. I know, is it in Wisconsin? It's in the little town of Hurley, Wisconsin. And done. It's they celebrated their fiftieth running of it about five years ago. So what year? So it's, you might have been in one of the first. I mean, I'm not that you're that old, but you know when, when did you you ran that as your first marathon while you were at Wasika? Yes, in, in the August of 1977. So that would have been your first year, second year. It'd been my second year. So you're yep, and it was in the fall. No, it was in uh, in August. Okay, so you're so right before you started school, right? Okay. Yes. So it would have been, yeah. So it would have been right before the fall cross country season of '77. So I thought, you know, I heard about this marathon and I, I was kind of intrigued by it. But I think my longest run was probably like a ten miler, you know. But <laughs> you know, when you're a young buck, you think. You know, I was 21, so I went and ran this thing, and and I I, I remember I was running with this older guy for about five miles. And I'm just yapping my jaws the whole time. And he, at about five miles, he turns to me. He says, Dick, he says, you can keep flapping your jaws all you want, but I'm not responding anymore. <laughs> he says, it takes a lot out of you. And I kind of felt kind of bad, you know. 
But um, you talking to other up, people, I'm surprised at that. That you're yeah, <laughs> no kidding. But I, you know, I finished. But I all oh, done. I was those last eight nine miles. I was a hurting buckaroo, and but I came across the finish line. I, I ran two two hours forty seven minutes and some change, and I remember thinking, I'm never doing this again. <laughs> it it felt that bad, and then you know I ended up running another one that a uh, couple months in October that year. <laughs> Um, you have a bad memory. I, well, and here's the deal. We had we had a cross country meet on Saturday and I didn't tell Coach Volkrod I signed up for the what they called it it was called the City of Lakes Marathon at the time, which kind of a prelude to the Twin Cities marathon now. So I ran that one and I think I ran like two thirty seven or something like that. And after that one, I really swore I'm never going <laughs> <laughs> to. I mean, no, the first one wasn't painful enough. You had to go back and do it again. So I had to go back and do it You did it again. one in August. You were running cross country, ran a race on Saturday, and then on Sunday. Was your season over at this point, or did you still have more cross country races? Oh, no, no. We still had a few more meets. So <laughs> you had, oh, my <laughs> gosh. I, I think Coach Underwood is probably you know thinking he had it pretty good after what you did to Coach Folkrod. <laughs> well, so then... We we didn't qualify for the um, in '77. We didn't qualify as a team, but me and one of my teammates, a real good runner, his name is Owen Dickey, and Owen still he farms down in southern Minnesota, and he still runs every day. And him and I qualified for the junior college national championships in New York City, out on Long Island. Wow. So we fly out there with Coach. He rents a car, so we get out onto Long Island. Now, we'd never been to New York before. You know, we're hunking country bumpkins in this big, biggest, one of the biggest cities in the world. So the next day, it was the day before the cross-country meet. And Owen and I wanted to go into New York City and buy something for our mom. Or I don't think we had, either one of us had a girlfriend at the time. And so Coach Folkrod let us use the rental car. So I'm, I'm driving, and Owen is looking at a map, and we finally get into downtown New York City, and there was no place to park. So I look down this one side street and I see no cars parked there. And there's no signs or nothing, you know. So we parked her there. We walked all over New York City and stuff. So it's getting kind of late in the day. So we thought, well, we better get back you know, to Long Island. So we walked down to where our car was parked. No car. I'm thinking, oh, and are, are we on the right street? And he goes, yeah, but he goes, our car is gone. So we're thinking... What are we going to do? You know, there were no cell phones or anything like that. So we're walking down Fifth Avenue. It's about 6 o'clock at night. We're sure Coach Folkrod is going nuts, wondering where the heck we are. So all of a sudden, we come up to a stoplight, and a, a, a truck pulls up to it and stops. And I, he's towing a car. <laughs> and I look at it, I go, I go, Owen. I go, gosh dang it, that looks like a rental car. <laughs> oh he said, no, it couldn't be. And in the back window, I could see there was a gift I'd gotten for my mom. I said, Owen, that's our car. So the guy still at the stoplight. So I go up and I jump up on his 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 step to the his cab and I knock on his door and he rolls his window. I said, Sir, I go, I go, Jeepers, I go, that's our car you got there. He go, I go, can you can you just drop it over here on the corner? <laughs> he started laughing. He goes, gosh, guys, I wish I could, but I can't. I got to take it to the impoundment. But he says, I'm not supposed to do this, but hop in. I'll take you there. Oh my gosh. So he takes us into this dungeon down underneath the street where all these other cars that were torn. And we go up to the, the desk and they go, it's going to be a hundred bucks to get it back. Well, be, between us, between us, we had $101. So we give them the money. They give us the car. By the time we get back to Long Island, the hotel, it's like 9 o'clock at night. And we go up. We knock on Coach Folkrod's door, and he's in a room with a bunch of other coaches. Oh, my gosh. He gave us the riot act. I mean, we were both had tears coming down our eyes. And he, he goes, get the H back to your rooms, and you better run well tomorrow is all I can say. As soon as we walk out the door and closed it, him and all them coaches just burst out <laughs> laughing and stuff. So, anyhow, Mikey, done. I could go on and on. I'm taking up too much time <laughs> this here. This is awesome, bud. I that I I think I remember a little bit of some of that, but that I could recall all those details. So the odds of you obviously you parked in a no parking zone. 
but there were no part. There were no signs. There were no other no cars there. No, so somebody knew something you guys didn't. <laughs> Your car, you, you leave. Who knows? You're gone for a long time. And right. about the time you come back, car's gone. You're looking around for your car and happen to see it getting towed down the street. Yes. I mean, in New York City. In New York City with the, 8 million yeah, people. Yeah, and how many city streets? Right. Hundreds I know. Hundreds of might, miles. Done. It was just by <laughs> dumb luck that we happened <laughs> to see it. Because uh, we, we wouldn't have known where to even go or to say, do you think somebody stole it or, you know, or impounded it but i'm glad you're still with us dick you can we could you could have <laughs> just appeared in new york city nobody ever heard of you again oh i know what i mean it's amazing and so um and you happen to have 101 dollars i mean no neither one of you guys had a credit card no uh, you know, a ch- no between the two of us honestly we had a hundred and one dollars we had one dollar left between us after that <laughs> <laughs> okay Ooh, well, good Good. Well, that that was an experience. How did you run the next day? I got to ask. So, you know what? Um, we both ran well. <laughs> I finished in, the, you know, there was a couple hundred guys. I finished in the top 50 and I ran, it was a five mile race and I, I ran like 2430. Oh, okay. for, for me, that was like my best time ever. And I think Owen ran somewhere in the 25. So he ran really well too. So, you know, coach was pretty happy with us about that. But, you know, I... I could go on about, I seriously, Coach Folkride, how he put up with me um, is beyond me. <laughs> I even wonder to this day. Well, I wonder about me too sometimes. Anyway, let's go back now. You're, you're finished up, that's cross country, but then track, your you're sophomore year. I know I, re, I remember hearing, or I know I've heard you maybe tell this story. In one track meet, you ran the mile, the three mile, the six mile, and the steeplechase. I did. So here's oh what happened, gosh. John. Go ahead. So here's what happened. So now this was in spring of 77. Um, yeah. So I always, we had a big, our big home meet on Saturday morning. And so I was down helping coach chalk the track. So he's at one end of the track and I'm at the other. And he was over by the the house at the, the, the little building where they stored all that stuff. And there, there was a phone in there because all of a sudden he starts screaming. He goes, and I'm at the other end of the track, Beardsley, get, and he goes, get the hill over here. So I go, yeah, coach. I run over there. I go, coach, what do you need? He goes, did you make up that, did you make up that dairy science test when you were at the national indoor championships? I go, you know, coach, I guess I kind of forgot about that. No, I didn't. He goes, you're ineligible. And he said some not nice words and told me to get the, you know what, out of his sight. Hmm. So I run back to the college and I run into uh, a friend of mine that was on our team, Jim Headington. He was a high jumper. He was about six, eight, you know, (laughs) and I I told him what was going on. Well, at this point now, all the, the professors have all gone home. And I will not mention the name of my professor, but he was a single guy and we always, you know, he dated lots of gals. <laughs> so somehow I was able to convince, and he was gone for the weekend. I was able to convince a janitor to let us into his office. And we looked through his desk, seeing if he had like a little black book with a bunch of phone numbers in it. Oh my so <laughs> wait, Doug, we're going through this book. We called about, six or seven different gals in his old black book. <laughs> and on about the eighth one, I go, yeah, it's professors or oh, so-and-so there. Well, yeah, just a minute. So he gets on the line and he was a big track fan. And he goes, here's the deal. He goes, I will be there tomorrow morning at 7 a.m. to give you a test. And he says, all I can say is you better pass it. So Don, I stayed up all night. Guys on the track team took turns quizzing me, going through all this stuff. I was drinking Diet Cokes like they were going out of style. And I didn't sleep at all. So I take the test. I get an 85. So I pass. He calls Coach Folkrod, says, Dick got an 85. He's eligible. So Coach was still not happy with me. So we get down there to the meet. And I ran. I thought, I got I to gotta help. I mean, I kind of get back on the coach's good side. So I can't remember what order they were, except I, 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 no, yes, I can. I ran the 10,000 first, 
then I ran the steeple, then I ran the 5,000, and then the last event of the day was the uh, the mile run, and I ran them all. And I, and I'm, I I don't want to sound like I'm bragging because I'm not, but I won them all. <laughs> I won them all, and and I was dead beat at the end. <laughs> but I thought, gosh, you know, and coach. To his credit, he tried to talk me out of it. He goes, he goes, Dick, you're, you're not running all four of those events. I go, no, nah, coach, I need to. I need to. I, I, I got to get back on your good side. He says, you're not on my bad side. I, but anyhow, I convinced him to let me do it. I was fortunate to win all four of them. You and, showed uh, a little potential there, I think, for, for things yeah, to come down the road. Things to come. So that was pretty that's amazing. I don't know if they even allow athletes to run all four events anymore. It's probably not. Uh, and you hadn't slept uh, the whole night before. No, I, I was up all night oh studying. Gosh. And like I said, you know, I had a diet of diet Coke. That's what I had all night. <laughs> probably a couple bags of chips you, you or something. You couldn't you know? have passed a drug test at the meat. <laughs> you were so jacked up yeah, on too much caffeine. caffeine. Yeah, they, they check for that now, you know. But anyway. I know. I it is. That's amazing. And so, okay, let's let's kind of recap here. You've ran uh, two seasons. You've run two marathons. You're kind of rolling towards the end of your sophomore, which your final year, right at, at the at uh, Wasika. And they, which is amazing to me, junior college has a national cross country event, and they have a team competition, and then obviously individuals can run. As yeah, well. it's a, it's a national championship, and I think they still do it to this day. I, I don't know. They, they actually, you know what? They don't. Oh. Well, they, they, they have it. They cut it back from a marathon to a half marathon right. now. So it was a full marathon. And, you know, you're a runner and you've run marathons. And was it you, our idea? Did Coach Folkrod, you know, think, well, what, Dick, you should, might as well do that. How'd you, how'd you get lined up into that? Yeah, so Coach Folkrod said, hey, guys, and there was three of us, myself, uh, Bob Franzen, and Jerry McNeil. They were both underclassmen to me. And they, they like to run long distances, and I think they'd both run a marathon. And so Coach, he uh, said, hey, guys, you know, there's this National Junior College Marathon Championship, and we need three people as a team. Would you guys, you know, want to run it? And I was, oh, for sure. And Bob and, and Jerry were too. So, you know, we upped our mileage. We did some 20-milers together and everything, and we went out to Dewajik, Michigan. And it's in the southwestern part of the state, very hilly, and it was held like – Mid June, it was like seventy five degrees at the start, you know, very and a very hilly course. And I finished, I finished, I finished either third or fourth. And if you made top six, you got, you know, uh, you were considered all American right. and whatnot. And Mike, the guy that won it that day, you will know who he is. A uh, Malcolm? No, it wasn't Malcolm East. Malcolm East. Yes, I remember. So Malcolm yeah. was went to Allegheny College, but he was from England, and they were a very very good or junior college program, and they, they recruited athletes from around. But, yeah, Malcolm East, who went on to become, I think, like a 211 marathoner, he won the race that day. Wow. And I got third or fourth. Well, because when we – the first time I ever heard about you was after that. I, I think, you yes. know, and, and this will probably lead into future episodes when we maybe get into the SDSU days when with you. Um, but I think, you know, we had heard that, you know, you were a marathoner. That's kind of what we remember hearing about you and th that you were an all American, you know, in, in junior college and remind me what your time was. Do you remember what you ran in the marathon? Yeah, I, I ran two thirty one, I okay. think, or two thirty four. Yeah, I think it was two thirty one. Yeah. Low thir two thirties. And, yeah. um, I'm trying to think, of course I would have been like a sophomore junior. And so my times are right around in that same area. So when we heard about this guy named Beardsley who might be coming to South Dakota State, we were kind of aware of that, that you weren't just a um, flash in the pan or something like that, if you yeah. would. And so, um, interesting. But Mike, yeah. so, so done. So we kind of, you know, got talked a little bit about my right, after right, high right. school. So now, okay, here you are, you're done with high school, you're a state champion in cross country. Now, how about that spring? Did you oh, yeah. compete in track? Did you win a state championship no, no, in track? I, I you know, I was really looking forward to my senior year. Um, I We had a really good distance runner named Greg Halling at Lennox. He had all the school records, mile and two mile. And uh, and so I, for two or three years, going to high school, I'd stare at that. We had the record board. I think most high schools, I think they still do. They put up the best of high school records they had at that school. And I'd see those every day. I had those memorized. And, you know, I never met Greg <laughs> Halling, but I wanted, if I ever, if you ever 
I hope he's still around doing well. Thank you, Greg, for because you were my inspiration. You know, you have to have a target. You know, when when you, if there's somebody up there, you go. I wonder if I can do better than that. You know, and so that was always my right. challenge. And but after my cross country season, uh, yeah, I was thinking, man, I'm going to just drill. I'm going to have a great season. I was really looking forward to it. I wanted to run a marathon. I was planning to run the Brookings Marathon that fall. I used to hold it in like November. I'm not making this up. And um, it was in November, and I thought I've been. I had actually done some some 15 mile runs in high school. And I thought, you know, I think I get, I feel pretty strong after cross country. I'm going to run a marathon. And, and I, I was, you know, I, I just thought that really intrigued me. And I was playing basketball one day, like you, you know, like high school kids do pick, a pickup yeah. game. I came down and turned an ankle. I thought I had broken. It. it sounded like a rotten board Oof, breaking. Yeah. I was convinced. I thought, Oh my God, I just broke my ankle. And I had to, they had it like my buddies carried me into the locker room and I think they went and got one of the coaches or something. And they came down here. My ankle was all puffed up and swollen and they called my mom and I said, it's broke. I said, I heard it. I heard oh. it snap. And, uh, they said, oh man, you know, and they called my mom. They, my mom had to drive us 14 miles from our house to Lennox and she came and I told her mom, I broke my ankle and she, you know, they hauled me into the car. You know, that's how you did it back in those days. And she drove right. me to my doctor's office. The guy who delivered me was still our family no doctor. Way. Yeah. It's like I'm 17 now. And, uh, I, they hauled me in there. I don't know. I hopped in there on one leg and they took me down to x-ray and he came back and he goes, well, I got good news. Your ankle's not broken. I go, what? I couldn't believe it. He goes, no, you pull the tendon off this, I don't know what it's called, your malleolus down there with a big knob that sticks out of the side of your ankle. Yeah. He said, yeah, you, you, you tore that thing off. And he goes, and you're really lucky because sometimes part of the bone comes with it. And then we right. have to go in there and, like, and, and screw that back together because it won't heal with that tendon pulling on it all the no. time. But he goes, in your case, it didn't. It was a nice, like, clean snap. <laughs> I guess you would. Cheaper. And the guy, he needed, he. He sat there and my mother said, I think he really enjoyed it. He was a military doctor back in the day. And he said, yeah, a lot of our guys would get what they call March fractures and he'd have to treat them. March fractures are stress fractures. We call them now, but he, he taped my ankle like a cast. It took him forever. I mean, the guy had like athletic tape and he started taping on my ankle and he, and I'm amazed because it was so swollen. It, but he, and I think I had to go back and have it retaped after the swelling went down and he basically put a cast on me. And I couldn't walk on it for like weeks, you know, two to four weeks. I was just like incapacitated. Well, you know, my confidence went out the window. I'm not running. I'm not training, you know, and, right. and finally, and it seemed like it took forever. Well, curse the cast or the splint or whatever you want to call it. It finally came off and, you know, you're kind of, and it was winter time, icy. And I didn't start running. I'd taken off like all of December, January, February till March. It was like the season. Now you got to remember the track season in South Dakota is like about a month long because of the weather. Cause we don't really get started with outdoor track till maybe in April. And then the first of May is the Howardwood Dakota relays. And then shortly after right. that's your conference and then state meet. And so I, I basically had to go into high gear starting in early March. And I remember I, I got out and I started doing long runs, trying to build up my base and stuff. And I only got to run if I remember why, we only, because of weather, we had so few uh, all weather tracks in those days. We had cinder tracks as well that yeah. I think I ran in five total track meets my senior year. So my opportunities are very limited, but I'm, I, I'll make a long story short. I did get the school record for the mile and the two mile. And so I was, which was what, uh, which I ran was what like, done? well, no, we ran miles. Now they converted it to meters because they run 1600 right. and 3200. So my times in the mile was like 425, which converts to like 423 point six i think that's good and my two mile was 941 which transfers into like 938 for 3200 meters or whatever it is and so uh i'm still like number three on the all-time lennox list and you know after 40 years a couple guys came along and and good for them i i'd like to think i was their greg hauling you know if your name's right. up there then they go i'm gonna get that guy i'm gonna get and they got and that's good you want those kids to get you and so i was you know pretty excited and I, and I wanted to go to south dakota state and i thought you know after winning the state meet i'd I'd get a scholarship. And I remember the university of South Dakota offered me a scholarship. It wasn't a full ride, oh. but it was, yeah, it, but USD was the freaking arch rifles of South Dakota state. Right. It's like the, and they didn't have much. I wanted to go into physical education, kind of, you know, looking down the roadways and, and there's, they had an archaic gym. They did now they have a dome, you know, if they would have had the dome, oh, then nice. I might've switched my decision, but I really wanted to go to South Dakota state. So my folks and I went up and we visited with Jay Dirksen and, 
And we basically just cut to the chase and said, you know, is there any chance I'd get any athletic aid, you know, financial aid? And now, Dunn, Jay was the, the head coach, coach track, track and cross country. And he was the, the, the director of that running camp I'd gone to th- for three years. So he had seen me, you know, come from basically nothing to where, you know, I was did pretty well by the time I got out of high school. And, and he said, Mike, we'd love to have you up here. But he goes, here's my problem. He had he'd given Mike and Mark Bills, who are two outstanding runners, two of the best runners right. South Dakota ever turned out from Lincoln High School. And they were both state champions in cross country and in track. And they they were faster than I was. There's no doubt about it. And and uh, they, he said that you know those guys got scholarships uh, and you know full rides. And right. I wasn't surprised by that at all. And and he said you know as a coach I I only have so many scholarships I can work with, and I have to spread them out not only with distance runners but field events, sprinters, hurdlers, you know whole, the sure. whole track team. And so, you know, if I just give all my scholarships to distance runners, we're not going to do very well in track because then I'm just counting on walk on guys. You know, I can't give the good athletes scholarships. And he and he kind of pointed out, he said, but my dad had had health issues. My dad had bypass surgery, uh, had a heart attack in 1972. This is 1975 uh, now. So he'd been uh, put on disability. And, you know, it was really hard on my dad because he was such a hardworking man. He, we ran a dairy farm and he also was a plumber. So the guy worked about 14 hours a day. You know, he'd get up and milk cows at five in the morning, get done with that, go work eight hours as a plumber. He was a union man. And he he always had jobs building hospitals and dormitories at colleges and stuff. Come home, do chores. I mean, he made a good life for us kids and, and just hard work. He was just a hardworking guy, but he was on disability. Now he started getting social security because he couldn't work. And even I think I got a check because as a, a dependent of somebody sure. on disability, and I never saw that you know, the money was used for my folks to live with and stuff. And so I qualified for quite a bit of financial assistance because of need. And so yeah. I remember Jay saying, you know, if it makes you feel any better, you can just tell them you're getting, you're getting assistance from South Dakota State. You don't have to say it wasn't with the athletic department. Because right. you know, it's, it's kind of like my pride was like, well, I deserve. Well, no, you don't deserve anything. You know, if the coach wants you and he's got the ability. And, he's, you know, and I really felt Jay did want me to go there. But unfortunately, he just wasn't in a position that he could, uh, he could give me a lot, any aid, any aid. But because of the financial assistance, I was able to go there. And so I, I did. And I have no regrets. I, I wanted to go there, and I think he, I, he probably knew it. And I'm, I'm going to cut you know, this story pretty short. We, we had some great teams before, even before you got there, Dick. And in our freshman year, we had four freshmen who made varsity. The Bills brothers, me, and a kid wow. named Mark Hillstrom out of Sioux Falls, Washington. We had one sophomore, Randy Fisher, who was my roommate. We had one junior, a, a guy named Jeff Herman, who was an All-American runner. And we had a senior named Pat Tobin. And he was out of Minnesota. And he had been a junior college transfer from a really good college. Oh, what's the good co- junior college in Michigan? That turns out a lot of good. Uh, oh. Yeah, you know, and I th- we'll think of it later. It doesn't matter. So, you know, we had a really young team. And, and we, we, he, we worked hard. Jay, Jay was a great coach. And, and I always remember this about Jay. You know, he didn't have any training rules. You know, in high school, if they caught you drinking beer or, you know, yeah. <laughs> heaven forbid, smoking a cigarette, you're off the right. team. I mean, there was no arguing right. about it. Nobody got a lawyer. Your folks weren't going to come to your defense. No. I mean, you were, you were taking your life into your hands if you wanted to take those kind of risks. But, you know, I got to be, I was 17 when I went to college. And at 18, you can drink at, in South Dakota. Right. You can drink uh, 3.2 Well, beer. you could back in Minnesota yeah. then, too. And so I remember he, he, you know, we had started the season and, and he, uh, he said to us, you know, you guys are here now in college and I'm not going to, you know, if you go drinking beer and stuff, that's on you. I, I'm not going to yeah. tell you you can't. But he said, let me just put it this way. He said, you know, I know how good of runners you guys are and how good you want to be. You know, he knew what was in our hearts. And he goes, and I know how hard you're going to work because he's our coach and he knew and right. we were willing to do whatever he had said jump off that wall over there. We would all lined up and jumped off the wall because sure. we trusted him with our athletic careers. And he said, I, I know how good you want to be. I know how, how hard you're going to work. And he said, I can't imagine why you'd want to go out and do something that would be counterproductive to those goals. You know, like staying out late, drinking. Yeah. Oh, I never had, I wouldn't have smoked a cigarette if you put a gun to my head, but you know, you're right. going to get those temptations and that's on you. If you want to do it, you're free to do it. But 
you know, he kind of reminded us, you know, what, what, what's your goals? What's your motivation? Why are you here? And you're responsible for yourself now. And I really respected that. You know, he took all the fun out of it because he laid the responsibility <laughs> on us. And, you know, he trusted us to do whatever we thought was right. And I don't, you know, we didn't betray that trust. And so, you know, our freshman year, we struggled because we were really trying to adapt to college life, going to school and all this. And we, we had our ups and downs. We had, our down was our college, South Dakota State, had never lost a dual cross-country meet to the University of South Dakota, our arch rival. Wow. Never in the history of, they'd been competing wow. against each other for like 30 years since like the, I don't know, the 30, the 50s or whatever. And they had a great team uh, that year in 1970, the fall of 75. And, and they came to South Dakota State to our home course and we dueled them. And the people, I, I'm not kidding, the, the kids came out and supported us. It was the old golf I course bet. on the north side of the campus. Coaches were there. I mean, this was a big deal. And I remember seeing the SDSU guys when I was in high school and they had these awesome blue warmups that zippers on the legs, they were kind of like, yeah. they were tight. I mean, they're, these guys looked like they were made out of steel. And I remember leaving the HPR center my freshman year with our team of seven guys run into the course as a group with those warmups on. I mean, we, I felt like a superhero, you know, going I to bat. bat. Well, anyway, I bat. we lined up in the, and I tell you what, the tension on that starting line, it's a dual meet, you know, it's, no, it's not like, but I tell you, it's USD and SDSU. And yeah. the crowd was going nuts. I mean, the people were cheering. They had their cheering section. We had our cheering section. Five mile race, gun goes off, and man, it is just tooth and nails. It's a, it's a freaking, it's a I war. Bet. And you know, we got beat on our home course for the first time ever. No, by one point. No, oh my one goodness. point. You know, we all crossed the finish line, and you know, we each had our own. You know, you kind of know. I was like fifth man that day. Top five score. And I got beat by a USD runner named Rusty Molstead. Rusty was a great kid. I think he was out of West River, like Sturgis area or something like that. Good guy. And he and I and Pat Tobin, we were the fourth. Pat and I were fourth and fifth runners. Mike and Mark Bills and Randy Fisher are one, two, and three runners that race. And Pat and I were dueling with this Rusty Molstead towards the last mile of the race. And Jay was out there and Jay could do the math in his head. He was doing, and he looked at Pat and I said, you have to, you have to beat that guy, you know, cause he was like their fifth guy. And, sure. and I remember looking over at Pat Tobin and Pat was my t captain, team captain. I'm a freshman and he, and, and we're dying. I mean, you're doing the best you can and you're, and, right. and Rusty most had like a gap on us, like five meters or whatever. And I remember Pat said, Mike, I can't, you got, you got to, I can't get him. I, I like, he just told me he ain't going to catch that guy. And I didn't catch him either. And Rusty beat us both. We got beat one, one point. If either one of us had passed Rusty Molstead in the last mile, the results would have been the other way around. We would have won by oh, one point. Wow. And so, you know, you kind of look at, I didn't look at how the other guys did. Mike Bills was our number one runner. Mike was outstanding. Three-time All-American. He got beat by Dan O'Brien that day. And if Mike would have beat Dan that race, that would have turned it around by one point. They finished oh first and second. Goodness. So you, you, we each had to carry, you each carry your own responsibility. You each carry your own load. Now we're there right. helping each other, but you can't pick your buddy up from across the finish line to get him there no. any faster. And, you know, it was a tough loss, but we all, you know, Jay didn't let us rest for these races. We trained through them because we had bigger goals, the bigger goals at the end of the season. And we took it stoically. You know, we, you hold your head up. You did you know, and I think Jay knew, and I think we all knew, did you run at your, your best potential that day? Yeah. If you honestly said you did go to bed that night, get your rest, get up the next Hold morning, go out. We're going to start and we'll keep training. And and we did that. And we, we were heading towards the end of the season and our, um, back in those days to go to the national division to me, you didn't have to qualify. You just went, oh. it was in Irvine, California. Now we're working South Dakota. That's a heck of a trip. You ain't driving that one. We drove to most cross country no. meets in the Midwest. All night driving trips were not unusual, but you ain't driving to California. The athletic director, Stan Marshall told Jay Dirks and he goes, you know what? You guys, and this is my kind of take on it. Your team's young. You're pretty inexperienced. You got beat by USD. Your first time ever in our <laughs> school history. Right. And he goes, and Jay told us, now Jay might've been playing a psychological game with us or no, I think he's probably honest. 
He said, if you guys don't win the North Central Conference meet, we're not going to send you to the Nationals. Now, you know, to go to the National meet's kind of the highlight of your year. It's what we've been training right. for. And not only that, it's at Disneyland. Irvine, California. Oh we could go to Disneyland. I'd never been out of the state of South Dakota. I've been to Minnesota. I've been to the Twin Cities. That's a far. And so when Jay told us that, he goes, you guys, if we don't win the conference meet, they're not going to send us to nationals. And uh, it was kind of like, wow. You know, and USD had this great team that beat us one-on-one. -on -one. And then you had to run up against right. Mankato. And and uh, there were other North Central College schools besides just oh, us. Yeah, two. Good yeah, we had like eight colleges. And the meet was in Fargo, uh, North Dakota State, Holmes course. And uh, so we said, okay, you know, we went up there. And uh, long story short, um, they, uh, USD only had five really good runners. And they lost one of their top guys to an injury. And we had a pretty good depth. I mean, I was like our fifth guy. And we had Mark Hillstrom and we had Jeff Herman. Jeff had been, hadn't trained real well that season. And he wasn't in our top five. But he was coming on getting stronger as the races went on. So we had some pretty good guys. If one of us yeah. fell by the wayside, we had a couple guys that could pick up the slack. Well, they didn't, and they lost one of their top five guys. And Rusty Molstead, I'm, I'm not telling you to brag. I, I, we, him and I were at the, and I think, um, I'm trying to think who else was there. Mark Bills. Mark Bills and I took off, and we, we, we beat Rusty, the guy who we should have beat. I wished I would have bought at the duel. And we won the conference. We won the conference nice. meet. And I tell you what, I crossed the finish line, and Jay Dirksen was at the end of the shoot, you know, as you go through the end. And I'll never forget this. He picked me up by the, under my arms and spun me around like a little rag doll. And if he, if he didn't let me go, I would have shot off into space. I mean, Jay was ecstatic. I mean, because I think in his mind, you know, we had he taken... to go to Disneyland. Oh, we are going to <laughs> Disneyland. <laughs> I never thought, should have came up with that one. And uh, But he was so proud. We had taken some really hits. And, and even in the press... Remember the, the 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 local sports writers were kind of down on us, you know, because U.S. Uh, South Dakota State had this great tradition. And we were like letting them down, and the fact that we rose to the occasion, uh, you know, it's one of my favorite memories of my running That's career. Awesome. And then we went to nationals, and it was at Irvine, and it didn't run well. We got ninth, and you know, I think looking back, it was probably uh, Mike Bills missed All American by like three or four places. He could have been a four time All American. Wow. And he missed just by a little bit. Mike ran. Mike always rose to the occasion at the big meets, and so did Mark. And uh, I did not have a great race. I was I was in our top five finishers, and I don't have a. We finished ninth as a team, and we, you know we were good. We felt good about our efforts. We went to Disneyland. I went to. It was the first time we'd ever went to the ocean. And I remember Jaws, the movie Jaws, had just come out like right. that summer. Yeah, none of us would go into water like over our ankles because being from South Dakota, it's like, man, I ain't get that's I can't even see the other side of this lake. You know, I've never right. yeah, I've never right. been in a body of water. I couldn't have swam to shore. And it's like exactly. well, anyway. So, you know, those days at South Dakota State, that's how I, you know, we got started before you got there. And uh, the whole thing was um we uh, I, I also wanted to run a marathon. You know, um Jay was a marathoner and he trained us like marathoners. We did 20 mile runs every Sunday in cross country season, uh, pretty much right up to the conference meet. I think that weekend before the conference meet, we cut it back to a 15 miler, you know, six days before the, the conference meet. And yeah. so we were just, re I was ready for a marathon. And so I went down to Topeka, Kansas. I was 18 years old, ran my first marathon with Pat Tobin, my team captain. We ran the whole way together and we just ran. I said, Pat, my goal is to finish this thing. He goes, me too. And I said, my goal, if it's really a great day and the weather, I'd like to run six minute miles. He said, me wow. too. And I said, well, that's our goal. We don't care if we finish and if we could run six minute miles, we'd be ecstatic. And we did. We finished third. We tied together for third place, ran 233 and change. The winner ran 231, a guy named Jerome Howe, who was a sub four minute miler. And he had showed up just, I think he was just running his first marathon, ran 231. And so, I mean, I was like, we finished that race. I, and it was a four mile, a four loop course, six and a half miles. Each loop came out to 26 miles. Yeah. And every loop we ran faster. So we paced it. We negative nice. split it. So, I mean, we, we, it's our first marathon. So we said, well, let's not go out and, and, and do like Dick Beardsley did and die the last eight miles and regret <laughs> ever doing this. But we kept getting a little faster and a little faster. And we finished, you know, and Finished third. I went back the next year as a 19-year-old, ran the same course with Randy Fisher. Now, Randy is my roommate, and Randy went on to be a 219 marathoner. So we turned out, you know, between Randy and I, and, 
And yeah. we, we claim Dick as one of us. And uh, Randy went, ran his first marathon at Topeka, Kansas. And I, it was my second. And we ran, we won the race, tied again, and ran uh, 229 and changed, wow. 229.20. And I'm going to blow my own horn. But I remember uh, Runner's World used to list like top 10, and it was like nine, uh, 16 to 19 year olds, top 10, 20 to 25 year olds. They kind of did it in age groups. And I finished, I ranked 10th in the country for 19 and, and 16 to 19 year olds. Wow. And I tell you, one of the proudest days of my life was to read my name in Runner's World magazine. I mean, that's, I that's like it. Now, Dick, you've been on the cover of Runner's World magazine. Well, but that was a lot I was happy ago. to have my name on there. Well, anyway, and so kind of wrapping this up, you know, uh, I got hurt. <laughs> I, this will come as a shock, but, you know, we ran indoors on this track at South Dakota State in the, in the it was called the Hyper Center, the Health, Physical, Education, Recreation Center. And the track, and Dick has seen it, it's basically a D-shaped track. Yeah. You have a straightaway, and then think of the letter D with a curve cut, connecting the straightaway. But between that curve and that straightaway is probably, I don't, it's not a 180 degree corner, but it's not much less than that. No. And it was 200 meters around. And so we'd go up there in the wintertime and do intervals and run races. And, um, you know, it was, it was hard track to, it was kind of hard on your body because you'd crank around those corners. And I had a great indoor season. I won like three races. I ran a, you know, I'm not bragging, but as an 18, as an 18 year, I was 17 still. And I'd ran 930, 941 in, in high school. In my first race at college, I ran, I remember I ran 918 for two miles. Wow. Yeah, so I dropped a you know, chunk. I ran two three-mile races indoors, and I went through the two-mile mark in 936. I was going through the two-mile mark on three-mile races faster than I could run two miles all within like four or five months. And it was because of the training I'd been going through with Jay Dirksen in, sure. in college. And just that whole mindset that you're not in high school anymore. And I, I actually won a two mile in 917 at St. Olaf at their college. So I'd won, oh, yeah. like, I'd won like three races and my foot was bothering me on an indoor track at South Dakota State. And I remember running on it and it, I felt something give and I got a, a, a stress fracture of my second metatarsal, took me out for the rest of that track season, indoor and out. Very disappointing. Came back as a sophomore um, and uh, had to have knee surgery, believe it or not, and uh, ran about 200 miles that summer after knee surgery in April. I had torn meniscus in my knee. And so barely got in shape for uh, cross country and uh, made the varsity. And we went to the, the conference meet and I got uh, strep throat. My girlfriend, oh, who's now my wife, the week that uh, I was getting ready to go to conference meet, I, uh, she called me up. I think it was in the dorm room. And she goes, hey, I hate to tell you this, but I got strep throat. And about the next day I called her up and goes, I said, guess what? So do I. And I don't know where I got that from. Anyway, yeah. and so I tried to run the conference meet and I was sick. I had strep throat. And Jay said, look, Mike, um, do the best you can because we can't bring anybody up from the JVs that's probably going to do any better. And I ended up, and I'm, I shouldn't laugh at this. I ended up not DNFing. I dropped out of a cross country race. It's like five miles and I was a hurting unit. I couldn't finish the race. I'm sure. I, I went to Jay that next Monday and I said, look, nationals are next week in, in um, uh, Springfield, Illinois. I don't know if I'm going to be any better. Springfield, Missouri, excuse me. And I said, I don't think I'm going to be, you know, I might be over this, but I'm not going to be in good enough shape. Why don't you take one of the other guys? And he goes, Mike, you're a sophomore. He goes, you still got two more years ahead of you. I want you to go for the experience. He goes, I'm not going to put any pressure on yeah. you. And I went, didn't finish in our top five. I was probably our seventh runner, if I remember right. We ended up fifth as a team. And that just kind of shows you our depth. They took me out of the equation. They, we did better than I did as a freshman. So we moved up to fifth place at the national meet. And then uh, uh, that led into our junior year. It's, it's just kind of getting close to when you were about ready to show up. And so uh, I don't know where we're at here on this as far as time goes, but I think this might be a nice spot. I think after we, we're going to stop here and, and kind of uh, let's recoup here a little bit. So Dick and I finished high school. I looked forward to college. I was ready to go. I was committed. I wanted to be the best runner I ever could be. Dick finished high school, wasn't sure who's ever going to run again or competitively, <laughs> just happened to fall into a situation at the school he was interested in attending for academics, if nothing else, had a good coach and a program, and that just kind of kept your 
I don't know, kept that fire, that ember burning, I guess you'd have to say. And then towards Absolutely. the end of your junior college career, the fire got a little bigger. You know, I think with those track events that you obviously uh, outstanding performances and then running a, you know, a national class marathon. I mean, back in the day in the 70s, if you're running the low 230s, you yeah. can be considered a national class runner at that point. So I'm guessing that kind of made you think maybe a little more about, I don't know, how did you, we're going to end with this last little tidbit, hopefully a little little taste for next time. How did you ever hear about South Dakota State? How did you get connected to South Dakota State? So, and quickly here. So my senior, not senior, but my last year of cross country at Wasika, we came over and ran the South Dakota State University Invitational cross country meet. And so Coach Folkrod knew Coach Underwood, and they talked, and, and then Coach Underwood I, apparently had a chance to see me run that and was talking to Coach Folkrod, so um, it just kind of all started to come into place after that. All right, so it was the two coaches. I don't know how, and you know, yeah, they know each other. I guess we're going to get Coach Underwood on this podcast someday, and we'll get the inside scoop. How did he ever you know, get connected with you? And uh, yeah. like I said, he's, he definitely uh, got a few wrinkles and gray hairs because of it, but, but, but I think <laughs> it, it turned out okay in the, in the big picture. Yes, it did. Well, Beards, I can't believe, I feel like we've been talking for about 10, 15 minutes here, and I think we're approaching an hour. And yes, I don't know if anybody done. out there is still listening to this. If not, hopefully we help put you to sleep, you know, and you can, you can, you can in, in, use this for future needs if it found it boring. But I tell you, every time I talk to you, Dick, I get, uh, I get pumped up. In fact, I'm heading out to work out right now, and um, I, I can't wait to get out there. Every time I talk with you, I think you said it was the same way with Coach Squires. 10 o'clock at night, don't call me so, low, so late, Coach. Right. I can't go to bed now because you're all jacked up. And that's kind well, of you and I Karen did. have a good, uh, good bike ride out there. Bob. All right, and you're heading to Oklahoma. Uh, have yep. a great time. Oh, say hi to Bill and Joni for me. <laughs> I sure will. I'm sure they remember. <laughs> I'm kidding, I'm kidding. Beards, have a great day and, and safe travels. I look forward to seeing you next time. You too, buddy. Talk to you soon. Okay, Bye-bye. Have, have a good day.